The Hour of Joy was the horrific end that sealed the fate of the Playtime Co. organization and its employees, ending its legacy with a bloodbath, with the mistreated adults getting their long-awaited revenge. As Poppy recalls it, everyone within the factory on that day were butchered indiscriminately, whether being innocent or not. Many of these adults and employees were adoptive parents of the children and many cared about them and didn't even know about the cruelty that takes place behind the closed doors that these children are transformed into the monstrous dolls. I remember hearing every moment of it. It went on so long, so agonizingly long. They tried to hide, to run, anything to stay alive. I remember their cries. What's going on? Why is this happening? What are those things? <laughs> Senseless slaughter, that's all it really was. They killed everyone. The guilty, the innocent, didn't matter. All that death didn't fix anything. And then, once it was all over, they dragged those corpses down below where they'd never be found. And they ate the bodies to stay alive. The prototype has to die for this, for everything. Many of the adults were even turned into dolls who disobeyed the organization's cause and wanted to fight against them. So Poppy's opposition against this savage event makes sense that majority of the people did not deserve the brutal treatment that they received. With the blood smeared all over the factory and bloody handprints being a grim reminder of that fateful day, with their screams of fear and agony still echoing through all the corridors. As a matter of fact, the only thing that separated the adults from the evil scientists and the employees became blurred and a thing of the past, which was their innocence and fight for a righteous cause to free themselves and others from those who oppressed them and made them into these dolls. That innocence was wiped clean and they became what they despised and what they were made into, monsters who massacred anyone in their way. So essentially, Poppy explains how they became uncontrollable monsters after this event and this is why they needed to be stopped. But as anything and in any conflict, there are always two sides to the story and the dull side is not a pretty sight. Going all the way back to the beginning, Elliot Ludwig, the founder of Playtime Co., always had a fascination with creating the most realistic dolls from mid 20th century, always trying to produce the top of the line toys and dolls, being very innovative. His obsession with making realistic dolls becomes only more severe when one of his loved ones dies, seemingly his daughter, which makes him experiment with puppy flowers, which are explained to have miraculous properties, making things go alive. Not much more is revealed until at some point in the later lifespan of the organization, authorities find the mutilated corpse of a little boy stuffed in a duffel bag in his property, which clearly had been experimented on having his vital organs removed to seemingly get placed inside the doll to be animated and carry his consciousness. Based on this, we can assume one of the major reasons for the organization to carry out these cruel experiments was to push the limits of the nature and see if Elliot Ludwig can bring back his deceased family member, possibly his daughter. He also had an obsession with realistic and innovative dolls, so maybe he wanted to make the most realistic dolls with human consciousness, which involved surgically removing children's vital organs and placing them inside plush and plastic toys. Eventually, after several experiments, the organization implements an initiative to make a home for orphans and have a scheme to encourage the employees to adopt the children, but a more sinister secret prompted them to do so in order to have more test subjects available in the form of the orphans, so they push on the constant need for test subjects to carry out their cruel experiments. As the load of work becomes heavier, the organization adopts another scheme called the Larger Buddies Initiative, where they place the test subjects' organs into larger, more gigantic dolls and toys in order to help with physical labor. After time, the 
scientists and employees involved in the experiments lose their humanity and care little to none about the children, simply seeing them as unimportant test subjects, even showing annoyance when the test subjects pose any defiance or resistance to be experimented on. Experiment number 1188. What's his real name again? Yada yada yada, we're added into play care that you weren't really getting along too well with the kids like everybody else was. But look at you now. The kids love you. Theo, nobody's gonna save you. This prison is where you belong. We'll let you out here and there to go see the kids in play care, but your home is here. And as for the prototype, his home is in the labs. This is your life now. Get used to it. So essentially, these employees become the true monsters, experimenting on not only orphan children, but also babies. So this creates a major fire burning within the dolls who were once children, that they have been abused and tortured unjustly, having their innocence and life stolen from them just to be tested on. This makes them attempt escape and at times murder the ones who caused their pain and misery. Although these murders could be justified as a way of self-defense, the toys who have been treated with little care and compassion, not knowing how to even behave, they are always tormented and bothered by a never-ending hunger, needing to feed their bodies, which they do the only thing an instinctual animal can do hunting and eating human beings as a form of food to feed themselves. The organization noticing this and their resistance, they treat the dolls worse and worse, even physically punishing them, which leads to many dolls having extreme resentment against their oppressors. That's when the prototype comes to play, who always had a fighting soul, never submitting to the will of the cruel employees involved in the experiments. A close call occurred this week in which he nearly breached containment. The prototype seemingly disassembled the digital alarm clock within his room and utilized the battery, along with several other components, to create a laser pointer, which he then fired into the security camera, disabling it. These actions allowed him 28.3 seconds completely unmonitored. Once function returned to the camera, the room appeared to be empty. One surveillance specialist went in to confirm his absence. However, Upon opening the door, she realized that the prototype had hidden in one of the camera's blind spots. The prototype attempted to escape through the open door. However, another surveillance specialist was able to remotely relock the door, despite the other specialist still being inside. One casualty occurred. The prototype seems to possess an unprecedented level of intelligence beyond that of all other test subjects, as well as an alarming willingness to commit violence. Further suppression treatments will need to be enacted to ensure that no other experiments develop these qualities. He starts conspiring against the organization with the dolls, showing them compassion and promises of freedom and better times. Keep in mind that he had been severely observed and monitored, so he had to only communicate with the ones that he could close to him, such as Catnap, who in return would communicate with the others. That's when, with the resentment building up over the years, the dolls plan a massacre altogether, attacking and killing anyone that they get their hands on. So that's when the hour of joy takes place, with many of the dolls participating in the senseless slaughter, with many other dolls hearing the screams and pain of the people, who amongst them were the ones who didn't even know about the experiments and even cared about the children. Many dolls like Puppy couldn't help but observe the brutal massacre, being helpless and not being able to help anyone. In one of the early tapes we find in chapter 1, one employee or scientist explains how the prototype is missing alongside many other dolls, which was a flaw in their observation and containment, and how next time the same mistake shouldn't be repeated and that the new experiment should be contained and disposed of in a secure location. Final log in relation, experiment 1006, the prototype. Coordination and cooperation is evidently within his skill set, as well as the skill set of all other experiments of his type. Though still missing, today's events are no doubt in relation to him. His absence was a flaw in the scientific process, which should have under no circumstances been left unaccounted for. That's why I'm making this log, so that the same mistake won't be made twice. Any future experiments will need to be contained and disposed of in a secure location. 
I'm not worried about myself. One breakthrough and I'll be back. We must forge onwards in the name of science. Whether those who are beneath us understand it or not. End of... While shouting and screams are heard in the background, with the scientists referring to them as the ones below who are breaking out and rebelling, the scientist continues that all they need is another breakthrough and he will be back, suggesting that even after death, his consciousness could be retained and put back in another body. That's when the luck comes to an end, with the scientist seemingly dying. So this reveals that the prototype was the brain behind the operation in the Hour of Joy, who was a strong opposer of the cruelty that was taking place and eventually managed to defeat them. They killed anyone they could, starting from the lab, playcare, and eventually going up to the game area and reception. The scientist in a mysterious way says that he is not afraid of death however, as he will be back, which raises the question, was their experiment a way to test the limits of life and death as well, and if they could find a way to immortality. This fully corresponds to the backstory of Elliot Ludwig, of how he could have possibly wanted to experiment and test the limits and see if he can bring his loved one back. So this is what led to the hour of joy and why the dolls killed so many. On one hand, I fully support their actions against the ones who directly had a hand in the experiments and intentionally sentenced them to a life of pain and misery. They essentially took their life and enslaved them, a fate worse than death. But the other ones who loved them and took care of them, the ones who were not even aware of the experiments, did they actually deserve such a brutal end? The answer to that would simply be no, but in the doll's eyes and perspective, dolls who were not raised like a human, many who were placed inside the dolls as babies, not being able to naturally and fully develop and grow, probably didn't have full comprehension of their actions and were simply acting on their instincts to survive, satiate their hunger and fight against the threat. They probably couldn't make higher decisions of who is bad or good and simply were taken away their humanity reduced to monsters, monsters who could actually be loving and innocent children. But experiments such as the prototype and mummy long legs, who seemingly were adults, seemed to have a higher understanding of the consequences of their actions and could tell the difference between good or bad. So manipulating the children who didn't know any better within the doll's bodies to commit such a massacre was a clear manipulation and nasty grooming. The prototype didn't stop there as he made the Playtime Co. his kingdom and killed anyone who stood in his way, who essentially lived long enough becoming the monster that he promised to destroy. He effectively became what he fought, oppressing the others and killing them. What do you folks think? Was the hour of joy justified or just a brutal senseless massacre? Let me know what you think down in the comments below. As always, it's been your host Star, and I will see you on the next one. Have a fantastic day.